Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be at Point Church in Church Point. Let me get my stuff set up here. And thankful for what's going on here. The pastor's been giving me a good report. Sounds like things are moving well for you, and I, I am thrilled. We are on the verge of the greatest days the church has ever known. I believe that. You know, looking back, I can remember when hardly anybody in the world knew anything about being filled with the Holy Ghost or speaking with tongues. And now everybody knows about it. Isn't that amazing? And God's going to do a great work, and it's going to happen right here at Point Church. And I'm going to be happy and rejoicing with you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be with you and to see how, how wonderful things are moving. Is everybody happy? Yeah. I have two friends here with me tonight, Pam Noel, Tammy Ray. Uh, many of you will know Pam from campground days. She was with the, my husband as his secretary for many, many years wonderful, wonderful woman of God that has served the kingdom faithfully. And Tammy had worked there with us, and they were kind enough to drive me down. I can still drive, and I do drive, but my children have gotten real bossy. And they, they tell me where I can drive and where I can't drive. And they said I could not drive down to Church Point and back the same night. So... Pam intervened and was kind enough to bring me, and I appreciate it so much. Well, I'm going to be do so, doing some, what I'm going to call exploratory teaching. I'm a teacher. I'm not a preacher. Have you ever heard of exploratory surgery? <laughs> well, I'm not going to do surgery. Don't, don't get nervous. But they call it exploratory surgery when they're not quite sure about it, but they know there's something there. You understand? So I'm going to be doing exploratory teaching tonight because my subject is heaven. It's a big subject. We may be here two or three days. No, not really. Don't, get, don't run out now, but... I, the reason I call it exploratory teaching is because we know there is such a thing as heaven. But do you know much about it? We know it's there, but we don't know much about it. And so tonight, I hope to help you understand. Some of the questions about heaven are, is it real? If it is real, where is it? Are people there now? What is it like there? Do you know the answer to those questions? Or would you like to explore with me and see what the scripture says about it and find out a little bit more uh, about heaven? You know, there's two subjects that we don't talk about much. We don't talk about death and we don't talk about heaven. We use the words death and heaven, but we really don't discuss it much. But you know, really, the scripture is full of instructions about both. And Paul, that famous statement that he made that he would, that it would be better to him to go and be with Christ, but he needed to stay here to finish his work. But he said, I would like to depart and go on to be with Christ. Death is, by the way, the word depart in the original language there is a picture word of a boat tied to one pier, loosening the ropes and sailing to another pier. That's what death is. We just leave this world and go to another world. And I'm anxious to find out about that. And I hope we can learn a little bit about it tonight. You know, heaven is really kind of a generic term. We just say heaven, but we don't really know a whole lot about what it means to us. But I hope I can help you tonight. First of all, heaven is the ultimate goal. I mean, all of life. You live to get to heaven. Really? I hope that's what it is. But I want to know a little bit more about it. Now, my, my interest, my really peaked interest in heaven has been kind of an oncoming 
thing. Uh, uh, you know, as I'm, it may be, you may say, well, it's probably your age, which I'm now 86, and I can start singing right now. I'm nearing that shore. <laughs> because of the way life happens, I just really am. I am it's moving that way. And uh, it's, it's part of life. It's part of the transition. And we don't need to fear it if you're a child of God. <laughs> Brother Barnes used to tell us that there was only a tissue paper division between life and the life after. And I, the more I thought about that, you remember the story in the Bible of the boy that was afraid because of the people surrounding the city, the armies, and the, the, the prophet prayed and said, open his eyes. And when he could see beyond that tissue of veil, the mountains were full of the armies of God. It was already there. He just couldn't see it. So you see, there are two worlds. The Mount of Transfiguration, you've heard of that in the scripture, they were there talking with Jesus when suddenly there was Moses and Elijah. And they were talking to Jesus. And they were, had come back from wherever they were. All of it's kind of mystical sounding, isn't it? But there is a real place called heaven. And I want to know more about it. I've had such an interest in it. Especially, I, I suppose, since my husband died. I want to relate to you the beautiful story of how he died. Many of you, y'all remember Brother Tenney? He loved this place. He loved this district. He, he died very quickly. He only was sick a few hours, although he had had a broken leg and was not, not doing well physically. And when I got there that morning, he was beginning to get sick, and we finally put him back in his bed about noon, and at 2.05, he breathed his last breath. But let me tell you about that last breath. His breath had become shallow, more shallow, and then all of a sudden, he took a deep breath like that. And when he let it out, he said, now I am in the presence of God. <laughs> and dropped his head and life was gone with that one last breath but I will never forget that that in one moment one moment he was in this life and in the next moment he was in that mystical heavenly realm somewhere in the presence of God and he was very much aware of it and so from that reason, I have had such an interest in heaven. And then I had a story told me this week of one of my neighbors. She was telling me about her mother's death. Her mother had been a wonderful, spirit-filled woman for many, many years. And she said she was in her bed, and she told her daughter, she said, I'm dying. And then just shortly thereafter, she had her eyes closed, her mouth was open, and all of a sudden, her eyes opened big, her mouth closed, and she looked very much upward and said, Mama? Because her mother had been a wonderful saint of God. Now, you may wonder if that's really real. I don't know. I haven't gone through that yet. But there are too many testimonies of people that I have heard and trusted that there is a life beyond this life. And there is a place called heaven. And I want to go there. And the more I study about it and the more I read about it, the more I want to go. Now, my first question to you tonight, is it a real place? You have handouts, and you will find on there many of the scriptures I'm going to be referring to. And I think it would be good if you would make a few notes maybe to go with it. So in the question, is it a real place? John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, this is Jesus talking. He said, I'm going to prepare a place. Not a dream. He said, a place. And I will come and get you and take you to that place. 
so we can satisfy our mind to know that heaven is a literal place. The word place is from the original word topos, which we get from that, the word that we use called topography, which means a locatable space on a map. You know, with me on that, the topography, that's a place and you can point to it on a map. And that's what the word place is used for, to say that there is a locatable space somewhere that you can put your finger on, that that's really a real thing. And then it not only says there is a place, but in that place, there are many mansions. And one translation said there are many dwelling places. There are many habitats or lodgings. Now that sounds real to me. That's not a figment of the imagination. So we know that heaven is a place we know there are mansions or habitable places in that place, and it is real, and it is a physical realness. So we know there is a place. So where is heaven? Heaven is up. We have scripture to prove that. Acts 1, 9 through 11, when Jesus ascended, the scripture said a cloud took him up into the heavens, and they all stood gazing, looking up. So we know that heaven is up. Even Satan knows heaven is up. Because the scripture says in Isaiah 14 and 13 that Satan said when he rebelled against God, he said, I will ascend into the heavens above the stars and the clouds. So there's more up in the sky when you look there than just clouds. God has a habitation, and it's up in the sky somewhere. Now, the Bible refers to three heavens. Earth's atmosphere, the sky you see, the clouds, the air we breathe, that's mentioned in the book of Genesis. It was created on the second day of creation. Then there's a second heaven, and that's the outer space beyond the space that where we live and breathe. That was created in Genesis on the fourth day of creation. That's where the planets and the stars and all those things are. And then there is a third heaven, and that is where the presence of God is. That is the dwelling place of God. How do we know it's real? Because the scripture tells us, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 4, Paul speaking, he said, there was a man, and he was referring to himself, that was caught up into the third heaven, and he saw and heard things that are unutterable to people on earth. There is a third heaven, and that is where God dwells, and there's going to be a fourth heaven. That is the place being prepared for those that faithfully serve him through the days on this earth. We will go with him to that third heaven and to the fourth heaven. Go with me on this. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now I'm talking about the second heaven then. The one with the air and all of this stuff. Because the scripture tells us in 2 Peter 3, 7, and then 10 through 11, that the earth will be destroyed. We burned up and there will be a new heaven and a new earth because the earth has been contaminated with sin and God is going to cleanse it, but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you know what? I'm talking about things I don't even understand, but I believe them. Because the scripture says that. I don't know how all this is going to happen. I don't even plan to make you believe that I understand it. But I know one thing that the Bible has told me that everything that is earthly is going to burn up. Your house, your car, your bank account, everything that you can touch is going to be destroyed. But it will not be annihilated. It will be renewed by cleansing and God will create the scripture tells us that a new heaven and a new earth isn't that awesome the new heaven and the new earth so uh, after that comes 
another thing that I want to mention to you, and I'm having to do all this in a hurry. You can't have time to explain a whole lot. But there's also going to be something called the New Jerusalem. Now, everybody, we all know there is a Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center point. It's the capital of the country of Israel. It's a very sacred city. It's where God had put his name. But he said there's going to be a new Jerusalem. So with all that's going to happen in this hereafter, we're going to have a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem when we get to the third heaven and the fourth heaven, the place that is being prepared. Does this kind of boggle your mind? But I think it's wonderful. In that new earth... There will be no more sea. That's found in Revelation 21 and 1. That means there will be no more separation. The seas will not be there. Revelation 21 and 23 tells us in the new earth there will be no sun nor no moon. Because the new Jerusalem will become the light of the world, of the earth. Folks, I'm not lying. This is scripture. And it's really going to happen. And I want to be prepared for it. And I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to do everything in my power to be sure I'm ready to go inhabit that. Because there are actually going to be people that will be living there for eternity. The new Jerusalem will be the capital city. You know, Abraham started out, Hebrews 11 and 10 is the scripture said, Abraham started out looking for a city. That's another place that tells me that that is a real place. New Jerusalem is a real place. And it's also called, and this is found in Romans 3.12, the city of my God. It is being built now. The new Jerusalem is under construction. The place you're going to live and the house you're going to live in is under construction now. It's real. It's actual. It's going to be there. But the new Jerusalem is going to change locations. Because the scripture tells us in more than one place, Revelation 21 and 22, that they saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Now, people that are smarter than I and that have studied the scripture say that the new Jerusalem will hover over the earth, probably over the old Jerusalem site, and it will light the entire world. Can you imagine what that's going to be? And it's going to be a spectacular place. Let me tell you, and I'm not even going to try to go into all the details of how the scripture describes it. But we do know the size of it. It's about 1,500 miles a cube. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. That's like from California almost to the east coast. One city. But when you think about it, how high that is, 1,500 miles high. You see, the highest building on the earth now is in Dubai. And it is 2,717 feet high. It's, It's a building of 104 stories. Now, in a multi storied building, they usually are about 12 feet high, the root, the different floor levels, about 12 feet high. So with that in mind, this 1,500 mile cube, there are 660,000 stories or floors. Just, it, it, it's just mind boggling. The walls of that city are made of jasper. Jasper is a precious stone. It's reds, yellows, browns, and then some of it have tones of greens, but there's not any blue in it. And that wall is 72 yards wide. That is three-fourths of the size of a football field. That's just the walls of the city. 
And verse 17 of Revelation 21 tells us that this was all according to the measure of a man. So it was, it was the measurements were given so that we could understand. Is it hard for you to believe that that's going to really happen and going to be there and God's going to do that and have that and build in that? Well, let me tell you how to handle that with your mind. I, I did this today. I practiced. I got to thinking about everything I've seen in the world. You ever been to the Grand Canyon, the Painted Desert, the mountains and the Alps, the snow-covered mountains, gone across the sea, and all of the things that are just so enormous and so beautiful and so awesome and so indescribable? Well, if you can imagine that we have seen such as we have seen, then what is God doing preparing this very special place for his very special people. It's large enough to accommodate the redeemed of all the ages. Now, I found this. I, 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 I didn't dig all this out of the Bible by myself. I had some scholars that I read after that helped me to understand this. But I, I have totally enjoyed it. And there was a mathematician that decided to calculate some things about this, and he has decided that this 1,500-mile cube can accommodate 20 billion residents, with each having 75 acres each. There are 12 gates that are made of solid pearl. Twelve gates, three on each side, north, south, east, and west. And those are named after, they have names on the gates, and it's the, the tribes of Israel are the names on the gates. Then there are twelve foundations, and I'm, I didn't even list this, but it's every kind of precious stone that you can imagine layered because you're going to have to have a good foundation to hold up a city that's 1,500 miles cube. And the names of the apostles are in the foundations that are holding up this wonderful city. The walls of Jasper, the city, the scripture says, is pure gold. So pure that it seems to be transparent. But there's one thing that's in the old Jerusalem that will never be in the new Jerusalem. There will be no temple there. Because God's throne himself, he will be seated in the new Jerusalem. And we will have access. I'm going to the new Jerusalem. I'm going to see the walls of Jasper go through the gate of pearl, walk on the streets of gold because God has promised me and he's prepared it for me and for you. And then this is interesting to me. There is a river of life with water that is sparkling, pure, and clear. And it flows from the throne of God. Now, you know, this is so beyond us. We can't even imagine this. I don't know what the throne of God's going to look like. I just know he's going to be there. I know he's going to have a throne. I know I'm going to be able to bow before that throne and cast my crown before him. And underneath that throne, there flows this wonderful, beautiful river. You know, I, I, I told you I did a lot of reading. If God created the world as he did, with all of the beautiful plants and the trees and the grass and the animals. And, and I, I mean, we've got a beautiful place. Now, man's messed it up pretty bad. But can you imagine if he did that in the first creation and he is going to do this new Jerusalem, this new earth for the people that he redeemed by his own blood? Can you even imagine what it's going to be like? The beauty of it. The interesting parts of it. The, but it's a real place, folks. It's real. It's a place. You can point to it and say there is such a place. 
Now, all of this we will inhabit after all of the last things that are going to happen on earth. And let me tell you another reason that I have studied this. I am pretty disturbed over what's happening in our world. It seems that daily it is going further from God, deeper into darkness, and I'm ready to get out of here. Are you? And I'm glad that I'm not doomed to do it that this is all I know. I'm going to go to a better place and God is repairing it for me right now. So now my next question is, where are the saints who have died already? Where are they right now? Scripture says they're absent from the body, but they are at home with the Lord. That's quite interesting. Do you know how many people die every day? 250,000 people. Because they tell me, now I, I don't know if I can prove this, but I mean this is what the people that are supposed to know say. That three people die every second. 180 people every minute and 11,000 every hour. That makes 250,000 people die every day. Death is a result of universal sin. And it is the way we get out of this contaminated world. For believers, death is not a termination of life. It is a transition into a better life. I believe that. When my husband closed his eyes and said, I'm in the presence of God, it made me determine more than ever that I want to get out of this contaminated world where my children are exposed to things that are so horrible. My grandchildren are exposed to things every day that I wish they didn't even have to see or know. But there's a better place somewhere, and I'm headed there. You want to go with me? You know, when do we go? What happens when you die? Jesus said to the thief... Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's not a waiting game. It's not sometime. But when you breathe your last breath, if you are a born-again believer filled with his spirit, you are immediately in the presence of God. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And the spirit ushers us into the presence of God. Stephen, when he was stoned, he looked up and saw Jesus in the sky, in the clouds, wherever it was, but he said, receive my spirit. It happens instantly. We will be changed, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in a moment, either death or the rapture, we will be changed in a moment and we will go to that third heaven do we go with a, as a spirit or do we go as a body? Now that's debatable. <coughs> but I, I tend to think, and most of the scholars that I read about or read from, they tend to think that it is a body situation. We know that at the rapture, we're going to be changed into a glorified body. But what happens when you die now and you're buried, your spirit goes to God, but is that an, just a disembodied spirit that drifts around? The scripture does not bear out that that ever happens. When God created man, he created him body, soul, and spirit. And most of the people that I read after, the scholars that have studied it, think that we will have a, a temporary body. And the reason they believe that is because there were people that died that were recognized later. Lazarus, <coughs> after he died, oh, I can't open that. After he died, he was seen. The scripture says that they saw him. The, the, the rich man that died saw Lazarus and recognized him. So I believe that we're going to have some sort of a body even after death here. Now when we get our glorified body, 
it will be like Jesus and his glorified body. And he walked through walls. You know, it's, I'm really brave to talk about things I don't even know. <laughs> but I know enough that it makes me want to know more. And it thrills me when I hear these kind of things. The third heaven is not going to be the new heaven. So evidently there's a holding heaven where when people die, saints of God die, they go to a place in the presence of God where they are a, still a body of some sort. But it is not the ultimate because then when the rapture takes place and we who are alive and remain are caught up, then those who have died and been buried will come out of the graves and they will be reunited with their bodies and we'll all be bodies. <laughs> Folks, it's real. This is not a fairy tale. This is from the word of God that these things are actually going to happen. You see, we have scripture that talks about the, not only the thief, but Elijah and Enoch didn't die, but they went to that third place too. It, it's all kind of mysterious. I, I, I agree with you that I, we, we can't figure, we're not even supposed to understand it all. But the scripture says, you think about these things and comfort each other with it. I'm going to get out of this world and I'm going to get out alive. And I'm going to live in a better place forever and forever. Now, what, let me ask you another story now, another question. What will we do in heaven? Now, I am a busy person. I'm a high energy person. And if I thought I was going to have to float around on a cloud with a harp in my hands for 10 million years, that don't sound very interesting to me. And I don't think that's what's going to happen because think of what God did in this world and all of the things that involve in life. And that's going to be much better. So what are we going to do in heaven? We're going to do two things. We're going to do worship and work. Now, I know you're happy about the worship, but you're wondering about the work. But you see, work will be transformed because we will not be living in a cursed body that's been ravaged by sin. We will not know tiredness. We will not know sickness. We will not know problems of any kind. And so work, and it seems that, that the heaven that's coming or going to be is going to be kind of designed after what God did in the beginning when he made Eden, the Garden of Eden, and he put Adam and Eve there, and they had two jobs. One was to worship and one was to work. He said, you meet with me every day and we'll walk in the cool of the day. That was worship. And he said, you tend the garden. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad we're going to be busy in heaven. Y'all want to float around on a cloud? Go ahead. I don't want to. I want to be doing something. I want to be enjoying the wonderful things that he has prepared for us. It is beyond description what is going to be happening there. And angels, they're going to be, they, I don't know how many a myriad is, but they say there's a myriad angels and thou, ten thousands times ten thousand angels and they're going to be worshiping and singing. Can you imagine the music, the worship, the voices of angels singing and praising God? It's going to be something. I just, I, I'm ready to go. Y'all want to make up a load tonight? <laughs> so work in heaven will be changed. It will be different. You see... Some people say, you know, God worked and then he rested. In the book of Genesis, you got God created stuff and then it says, and he rested. But it wasn't that he was tired. He was reflecting on what had been done. There's a difference in that. So Adam and Eve were given the place to work and worship. Now, I found a scripture in all this study that I never had noticed it before. And it's kind of strange. I'm just going to let you... Think about it. John chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said it. 
He said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. I don't know what that means. I'm just letting y'all think about it. <laughs> Could that mean they're working on that place they're preparing? I don't know, but I know this. Work is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. And he gifted each of us with all the different gifts that gives us the, give us the innate ability to do all of these kind of things. Well, if he has gifted your wonderful praise leader up here. I listened to that voice tonight and these people singing. They're not going to just be floating around on a cloud. They're going to be singing in the heavenly choir. It's going to be real, people. We're going to sing and rejoice and it's going to be awesome. And all of the gifts that he put in us, he told Adam and Eve to tend the garden and the scripture refers to the heavens sometime as a garden. Brother Pablo is a botanist. Maybe he'll be taking care of some of the trees of life. There are going to be trees there. Did you know that scripture teaches there will be animals on the new earth? Now remember there's a new Jerusalem and a new earth. The scripture says that in that day the lamb will lie down by the lion. That nothing will ever be hurtful anymore. And that the snakes will be satisfied with dirt. They won't be biting anymore. Y'all thinking about that one, aren't you? <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you that it's going to be something where God is going to take his people. There is a real place made for real people and it's really going to happen. Now let me give you another little insight. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah were seen there. Now Moses had been dead for thousands of years and buried. Elijah was caught up in the fiery chariot, so he didn't even die. But they were recognizable people and they were called by their name. I'm still going to be me. And you're going to be you when we get to heaven. But we're going to be perfected. You ever wondered how old we'll be? <laughs> Most scholars think, now this is way out there. I can't, don't have a scripture for this. But they think that we probably will be around our 30s. Because that was considered kind of the peak of maturity. Thank God, I'll look better than I do now. <laughs> but I do know this, we're going to be known by our names. Jesus said, you come with me and you'll have supper with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just because they died thousands of years ago doesn't mean they don't have still the same names. So Jared Pavlou is going to still be Jared Pavlou. I'm going to be Thetis Tenney. But we're going to be real, but we're going to be so much better than we've ever been before. We're going to rule and reign with him in heaven. Daniel 7, 18 and 27 says that the saints are going to rule and reign over the earth. 1 Corinthians 6 and 2 says the saints will judge or govern the world. Now I'm really getting in deep water now. But I, this is what I've been taught. What I, You've got the new earth, then you've got the new Jerusalem above the new earth. The new earth is going to be inhabited. You can prove that by scripture. But the bride of Christ, those who have taken his name... How many have been baptized in the name of Jesus? You're in the bride of Christ. We're going to be living in the new Jerusalem. And the scripture teaches that we will judge the nations. I don't understand it. I cannot explain it. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I have scripture that tells me that we're going to rule and reign. 
there are scriptures that say, and I've got them on, they're in your scriptures somewhere. I don't know where I've, where I've got them. I'm, I'm not with my notes right now. But that there will be kings and nations that will come to the new Jerusalem and bring tribute and see the glory of God. Are y'all just really befuddled now? You know what? Look what man has done. Look what man has done. They've gone to the moon. They've done all kind of things. Built all kind of stuff. What do you think God can do? Suspend a beautiful city over the earth and the whole earth that is inhabited by other, I don't know who, but they're going to come and worship at the new Jerusalem. But thank God I'm going to have a house in it. I'm promised a mansion in that place called the new Jerusalem. Anybody here want to go to heaven? We're going to know each other in heaven. Book of Job, chapter 19, verse 26 says, In my flesh I shall see God. Luke 22, 29, and 30, Jesus says, You will sit at my table and eat and drink in the new Jerusalem. Jesus ate food in his glorified body. I know I'm in deep water. You know, we're going to wear clothes in heaven. We're not going to be just spirits drifting around because the scripture says in Revelation 3 and 5 that the overcomers are clothed in white garments. And when John saw Jesus in the first chapter of Revelation, it describes his beautiful garment down to the, his feet, a flowing white garment. We will be perfected beings when we all get to heaven. Do you want to go? Is it worth anything to get there? You know, let, let me just close with this thought. It, all the good things you can do will never buy you a place in heaven. It is the trusting of the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And if he loved you enough to die for you, can you imagine what he's preparing for you? And so we will be there with him forever and forever. Now all the good things that you can do will make a difference in heaven. We have a parable that Jesus told about a, do a nobleman that went into a far country. And before he left, he gave to his servants, that us, gifts. He gave them something to work with. And all of us have something to work with. We're gifted in some way or other. And our good works will never get us in heaven. But your good works for the kingdom will make a difference after you get to heaven. Because he told the parable that one man that gave all that he had and invested everything he had into the kingdom work, he said, you be ruler over 10 cities. I don't understand that, what we're going to do, but he said you're going to rule over 10 cities. And the other man that did pretty good, he said, you rule over five cities. But the man that didn't do so good... It didn't fare well with him. So while you are preparing to go to that beautiful place, let me advise you to invest in the kingdom. You're going to be rewarded over there for the investments you give to the kingdom here. It won't get you there, but it'll make a difference when you get there. Because he is going to be fair and say, you did so well, you enjoy this. I want to go to heaven. Anybody here want to go to heaven? Will you stand? I want to sing that old song, when we all get to heaven. Anybody know that? Oh, when we all.
wondering if some people in this room have started to visualize what it may be like on the other side of that 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 napkin as she said just that that tissue that, that just between us and heaven I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to going to that place. I'm looking forward to what God is gonna is doing right now for us. And I'm I, I, all I know for sure is whatever it takes, I need to be ready. I need to be ready. It may be in the next minute. It may be 50 years from now. I don't know, but I need to be ready. Anybody want to be ready? Anybody want to be ready? I'm telling you, you can be in that new Jerusalem. You can be in heaven. And, and, all, and all we have to do is take the name of Jesus in baptism, be baptized in Jesus' name, repent of our sins, and we will be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you are on your way. You're on your way. That is the, the, the initiation card to begin living for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we can see heaven. Does anybody want to go to heaven? Does anybody want to go to heaven? I wonder if just for a moment we can we can maybe gather around in the front or, or step out and let's just worship God for just a moment and, and give him praise for what he's already doing for us right now in heaven. Just for a moment today, can we just give the Lord a hand clap as they sing and just kind of worship him as we enjoy and think about what God is doing right now for our good. Thank you, Jesus, for heaven. Thank you, Jesus. song to remind us of what's coming when we all get to heaven a day of rejoicing you know that only that only really really plays in when you've been through some things and you recognize that that day of rejoicing which will never end is worth going to it's worth going to what a day it will be when we all get to heaven praise the Lord sister Tenny thank you so much for opening our eyes opening our eyes so reminding us of what's to come I, I say it often, but sometimes we get a little caught up with what's happening right here, and it can kind of cloud our minds, but if we can get our focus on what's to come, it changes our perspective, and perspective is everything. Perspective is everything. So thank you so much for helping shift our perspective in this place when we all get to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank each and every one of you for being here on this midweek service and worshiping the King of Kings and learning a little bit about heaven. It's been awesome. I can't wait to see each and every one of you on Sunday. It's going to be an amazing day. I'm believing God's going to do miracle signs and wonders. He's going to be changing people's lives. I'm, I'm praying for people to get the Holy Ghost on Sunday. I'm praying for people to be baptized in Jesus' name. Let's get our mind on the mission and let's come here letting God do amazing things in this place. I can't wait to see each and every one of you here. Thank you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click Give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.